Some people say a man is made out of mud A poor man's made out of muscle and blood Muscle and blood, skin and bones A man that's weak and a backward stuff Every day in America, 83,000 coal miners get up and go to work. 4,000 of those in Illinois alone. And they produce a billion tons of coal a year. 90% of that is headed straight for the electrical power plants. There are about 1,500 coal-fired electric power plants in the U.S., 83 of them in Illinois. And believe it or not, within a three-mile radius, of three quarters of a million people in a residential area within the Chicago city limits, there are two. This is coal passing through the Pilsen and Little Village neighborhood. We can assume that some of it will probably be arriving at Fisk and Crawford power stations. But how does that coal become electricity? 16 tons of water. A series of conveyors transports the coal into the plant where it passes through enormous pulverizers that grind the coal into a fine powder prior to burning. The pulverized coal is fed into a large industrial furnace that is surrounded by boiler tubes filled with water. The intense heat from the burning coal heats the water in the boiler tubes and turns it into steam. The steam is transferred under pressure at high speed through large pipes to turbines like these. It's this pressure and flow that pushes the blades of the turbine, causing it to spin. The turbine is connected to a generator that contains a rotor. Large electromagnets are attached to the rotor that is located within coils of copper wire called the stator. As the generator rotor spins, a flow of electrons is created in the stator. This produces electricity that can be stepped up in voltage through the station transformers and sent from the station across transmission lines. Pedro quotes the EPA study released this year, 2010, when it says the Crawford and Fisk power plants are the two largest sources of particulate forming air pollution in Chicago and contribute to the area of far exceeding federal health standards for particle pollution. In October of 2010, the Environmental Law and Policy Center released a scathing study saying that these two coal-fired power plants operated in the most densely populated area with the oldest equipment producing the most pollution of any coal-fired power plants in the country. The report goes on to say that in eight years these two factories cost over a billion dollars in health damages to people who lived within a hundred miles from 2002 to 2010. So where are political heroes? Where is regulation? Where is help when you need it? When President Obama took office, he listed the environment as one of his top three concerns. His answer to incentivize businesses to clean up their act was the tap and trade system. So how does cap and trade work? Well, pretty much all serious scientists agree that we need to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere to 350 parts per million if we want to avoid climate disaster. In the U.S., that means reducing our emissions by 80 percent, maybe even more, by 2050. 80 percent? Now, the problem is that most of our global economy runs on burning fossil fuels, which releases carbon. The factories that make all our stuff, the ships and trucks that carry it around the world, our cars and buildings and appliances and just about everything. So how are we going to reduce carbon 80% and not go back to living like Little House on the Prairie? Well, these cap-and-trade guys are saying that a new carbon stock market is the best way to get it done.
the first step would be getting governments around the world to agree on a yearly limit on carbon emissions. That's the cap. I think that part is great. So how do they want to ensure that carbon emissions stay under the cap? Well, governments would distribute a certain amount of permits to pollute. Every year there would be fewer and fewer permits as we follow the cap to our goal. Innovative companies will get on board, building clean alternatives and getting more efficient. As permits get scarcer, they would also become more valuable. So naturally, companies who have extra will want to sell them to companies who need them. Cap and trade or emissions trading is actually a huge problem. The latest bubble just burst, and now they have a new idea for a market. Trading carbon pollution. They're about to develop a new $3 trillion bubble. But when this one bursts, it won't just take down our stock portfolios. It could take down everything. Pero agrees with this. In addition, it believes that this would offer the chance to buy indulgences, that is, for businesses to postpone needed improvements based on buying their way out of it. All right, for more on the cap and trade bill and the potential for the carbon market, Richard Sander is founder and CEO of Climate Exchange. He joins us now from Chicago. The Climate Exchange, by the way, is the only voluntary greenhouse gas emissions reduction registry and trading system here in the United States. Richard, by the way, is known as one of the creators of financial futures back in the 70s. He helped develop the Chicago Board of Trade's interest rate contract. And then a decade later, he helped pioneer the idea of turning air pollution into a commodity to reduce emissions from power plants. By so I got to ask you, how how effective do you think market forces will be really in pushing companies to reduce their emissions? That's what this is all about. How effective will it be in your view? I think market forces will be incredibly effective. We have a couple of examples in the United States. In the case of acid rain, they reduced emissions from 18 million tons to 9 million tons since the Clean Air Act of 1990. They did the same thing with NOx. There's an interesting op-ed that was written by uh, Spectra Energy CEO Greg Ebel, and he, he talks about a report released by Friends of the Earth. He says, they say that the cap and trade would create a market for environmental derivatives. If you liked what traders and certain Wall Street types did to our financial system with mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps, then you'll love what they'll do to our environment. I think people are nervous about this type of market and whether or not there's going to be enough regulation uh, and transparency to make sure it really runs efficiently. Shouldn't we be worried? I don't think we should be worried at all. The main jewel in the financial sector during perhaps the worst calamity since the Great Depression has been organized regulated exchanges such as ours. How big? ultimately do you think this market could be? I think it's a ten trillion dollar a year market. Say that again? Ten trillion dollars a year. You're not worried about any kind of financial meltdown related to this kind of trade? No, Jaded, we've had no problems, no failures, and in fact it's very important that good folks like those organizations understand the difference between regulated exchanges right. and different markets with no opaqueness.
cap and trade made it through the House of Representatives in 09, but stalled and eventually flickered out in the Senate. The reasons were numerous. First, the economy tanked, so basic needs trumped future ones. Second, cap and trade was quickly settled with the pejorative tax. It wasn't literally a tax, but even as President Obama said, it would have initially caused energy prices to skyrocket, thereby raising the cost of nearly everything. In effect, a fee for change. Third, the compromises made in an attempt to get it through Congress diluted it to the point of ineffectiveness. The final nail in the 2010 coffin for cap and trade was the election in November, which ousted so many loyal proponents of the bill. Obama vows to revisit the issue with renewed vigor in 2012. In the meantime, what about the good folks in Pilsen and Little Village? Well, they never wanted the Byzantine cap-and-trade system to begin with. They just wanted the EPA to do its job. The Crawford and Fisk plants had been grandfathered out of living up to emission standards because they were built too long ago. In the summer of 2010, the demise of this loophole looked imminent. The Chicago Tribune ran an article that said, the proposed rule renews an attempt by the U.S. EPA to reduce pollution in areas around coal plants and in states downwind. The rule will reduce sulfur dioxide emissions by 71% from 2005 levels by 2014, said the EPA. But by the end of the year, it looked like the tide had changed. The New York Times reported, and I quote, Now the EPA says it needs until July 2011 to further analyze scientific and health studies of the smog rules and until April 2012 on the boiler regulation. Mr. Obama, having just cut a painful deal with Republicans intended to stimulate the economy, can ill afford to be seen as simultaneously throttling the fragile recovery by imposing a sheaf of expensive new environmental regulations that critics say will cost jobs. As for the people in Pilsen and Little Village, they just want clean air. Whatever way, by hook or crook, they just want clean air for their neighborhood and for their children. Right now, it appears that any efforts that have been made are stalled for the time being. As for my brother-in-law, he'll soon reach his 30 years at the Crawford Power Plant and retire. He has three more years till he reaches that mark, but right now it doesn't look like there's anything that's going to happen to shut down his plant and thwart his retirement party.